So we'll continue talking about rotator cuff disease. And John just informed us that these interstitial tears have been better described in cadaver studies in older individuals than in either imaging or arthroscopic techniques. Uh, so uh, uh, here's a case where we can see here's the supraspinatus tendon. The muscular tendinous junction is over here near the glenoid. Uh, it should be over the 12 o'clock position, so that's uh, been uh, medially displaced. This is the, actually the distal end of the tendon here, and what we see here is what looks like con continuity of the tendon is scar in situ. And we can see this patient had a prior uh, surgical repair with a suture anchor placed in the greater tuberosity. So this scar in situ can actually be very dense. However, the material itself is pretty friable. It's not very strong. Uh, so this is, uh, and uh, this is really a, a complete tear uh, from the surgical uh, fixation site with proximal retraction. And this is just the scar in situ. And you can see contrast is going freely through the area of the tear into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Okay. So, uh, let's see, uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? 60-year-old with chronic pain, real cuff or liberal tear, and we have uh, coronal let's see, T2, and I see, uh, and then a let's see, was a fat or PD fat set on the right. PD fat set, it is been a fat set. Uh, so it looks like uh, now on the PD fat set, uh, it looks like there's you know a very high uh, hyper intense signal. Uh, involving uh, uh, basically the distal uh, subscapularis. And however, on the Wait. T2... We don't see the subscapularis on this image. I'm sorry, <laughs> supraspinatus, pardon me, sorry, the supraspinatus tendon. And, uh, and then, however, on the T2, it looks like uh, really that it's uh, intermediate signal intensity. Um, I, however, I do think that the... Uh, the tendon itself is retracted. I think that the musculotendinous junction is um, retracted back. So I think what we have is really a full thickness tear with attraction. And I think that's uh, the intermediate signal uh, represents uh, granulation tissue or, or scarring. Okay. So this is another case of scar in situ. And, uh, uh, and then, uh, let's see, this is on 10 4, 2010. The, here are the sagittal images, uh, another coronal image. Again, it looks like there may be some tendon here, but there's proximal retraction. This is the distal end of the tendon. This is scar in situ. And here we have scarring overlying the area of the full thickness tear. Can you go back to that uh, prior one? If you look at the distal tendon that's a wells, it's really quite uh, hypertrophied on the left image. Um, and then what's described uh, in the cadaver studies is there, there, there actually is thickening of the tendon where it's evolved and, and kind of uh, pinches between the, uh, the chromion and the, and the greater tuberosity. Interesting, <clears throat> which is what we're seeing here on the T2-weighted image. I may very well be with their talk. Yep, okay, good. So that's another tear with scar in situ. Uh, this is what a, the patient then went into arth had uh, arthroscopy. Uh, this is the initial look from the glenohumeral joint space. What we can see here is the uh, this is the supraspinatus tendon. That's the tear of the tendon, and all this tissue we see back here is the scar in situ or the scar tissue. If you actually look at it from the bursal side. It actually looked more or less like it was intact, a little bit of calcifications here. Uh, but that's because of the scar tissue uh, was uh, almost complete uh, going over this particular tear. But on the joint side surface, you can see where the supraspinatus tendon itself is torn and retracted. And this is all the scar in situ that was there uh, at arthroscopy. So they went in and debreeded it on 10 29 2010 and did a primary repair. Uh, the suture anchors are over here, and these are the stitches bringing the distal end of the tendon back over uh, to, to fix it. And uh, uh, in this particular case, this patient had a normal arthrogram. I mean, not a normal, had a, had a 
no contrast went from the glenohumeral joint space into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So this scar tissue in situ was so dense that it actually was a watertight seal. So just because you don't have uh, fluid going into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa on an arthrogram doesn't mean you don't have a complete tear if you have mature scar tissue forming. Functionally, it's not working like that. Yeah, functionally, the, the scar is not very strong. Uh, it has a lot of inner, uh, nerve fibers in it. It can be very painful. So, functionally, it does not work well. Okay. Uh, well, there's also a capsule and a synovial membrane. Yeah, also there. That's right. Very, actually, uh, considering the size of the joint, very thin. Yeah. So that's, you don't see it much on uh, uh, MRI. Right. Okay, uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? <clears throat> this is a 29-year-old asymptomatic male. Uh, I can't quite a... hear you. Can you? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me try this again. Uh, is this better? Yes, <laughs> okay. that's better. 49-year-old asymptomatic male, and uh, we have a coronal, I'm sorry, <laughs> sagittal. Uh, it looks like a, I'm going to say a T1. Uh, and then we have, uh, or PD, and then a coronal PD fat sat image. And let's see, some mild AC torn arthrosis. It looks like a, uh, the distal supraspinatus, uh, there is some uh, in intermediate signal. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I would say at this point it's uh, uh, mild uh, distal supraspinatus tendinosis. Okay, so this uh, is tendinosis. This was actually uh -huh. my shoulder back in 1998. And you can see that there's a little bit of tendinosis in the tendon. Uh, we're trying some new protocols. Hey, look at this. Uh, uh, at that time, I didn't have increased subcutaneous fat. <laughs> I can't say so much for now. Okay. So there's some tendinosis. This is uh, 625 2008 the tendinosis. Now, this is 621 2007. Uh, obviously, a little bit different technique here. This is nine years later, and at that time, I had had intermittent. Uh, pain in the shoulder after uh, body surfing uh, down in Costa Rica and severe pain for the last five months. So what do you think now? Well, it looks like there's been some regression of the AC joint arthrosis. And then, uh, uh, so what we have here is on the coronal uh, PD and uh, it's like PD fat side image. It looks like we have a, a hyper intense signal now in the uh, distal uh, supraspinatus tendon. And uh, it looks like a uh, 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 on the PD, or is this, anyway, uh, actually it's maybe the T2, 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 yeah, so T2, uh, it looks like actually there is a, a little single strand, or maybe a few strands of the fiber that maybe still make it, so I'd say this is a, I mean, a high grade, uh, you know, partial tear uh, of the uh, supraspinatus so, so tendon, what I think this is, that I think this is a full thickness tear. This is some okay. scar in situ to that's in in that location that okay. developed over that time. And here we can see the full thickness tear uh, here on the PD fat set at the anterior insertion of the supraspinatus tendon, which is the most common location for origin of tears of the supraspinatus tendon. So this was on 6.2707. On the sagittal T2 weighted image there, you can see the tear right at the anterior insertion of the supraspinatus tendon. So, uh, so at, at that time there was a discussion. I was scheduled for surgery. The night before surgery, I called and canceled. Uh, so we decided physical therapy. So we began physical therapy with the concept being to do physical therapy where you strengthen the tendons on either side of this, not s stress the, the anterior supraspinatus much, uh, to, to, uh, and see what happens. So this now, this is on 6:21:07. Now this is two months later. What do you think at this point? Two months later, uh, I'd say essentially very similar, uh, no significant change. I still see it's the full thing, full so thickness tear. If anything, it's a little bit better defined. At this point, the yeah. symptoms were a little bit better, but it still hurt. Now this is uh, uh, kind of six months later on 12-20-2007. Mm -hmm. uh, at this time, my symptoms were markedly improved. What do you think at this point? Um, so it looks like on the uh, uh, 
It looks like on the uh, pro, uh, the P or the T2 fat set uh, image uh, on the left, the uh, we still see a uh, high grade uh, PD fat set in T2. Uh, I'd say we I'd say on the T2, it looks like maybe there's uh, been some inner in some uh, uh, maybe some scar in situ that's uh, on the articular side that's yeah. forming there. I, yeah, I think, and that's one of the reasons why I like the, yeah. the T2s without fat suppression. Yeah. Is I think we can see that much better on the <laughs> PD fat set. You can window and level it, and you kind of see that there's some gray material here. But but I think that we're better able to visualize these more subtleties of the pathology on the T2 weighted images without fat suppression. And I think this was scar in situ, which was developing at that particular time. Uh, the symptoms were markedly improved at this particular point after uh, uh, four months of further physical therapy. So this is on 8-20, oops, this is 10-9-2008. Wait a second, let me go back here. So 8-20-2010, 12-20-2007, improved symptoms. Now if we go further, this is 10-9-2008, so we're like eight months later. What do you think at this point? Uh, I think on on the uh, T2, uh, the coronal image, it looks like there's even more uh, 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 scarring forming there. It's uh, even progressing even further. Continue to, so, you know, it's, it's uh, continuing to improve. And the, it's harder to see on the PD fat sets. At this time, I was completely asymptomatic, and I was back at the gym uh, doing really full exercises again, 10-9. Uh, and here we can see that there is some scarring in the area of the, of the of the tear, and this is nine eighteen two two thousand and ten. Uh, so this is uh, uh, quite a few months later again, and again we can yeah. kind of see the scarring and scar in sight to in that location. And at this point, there are really no symptoms associated with this, but you can still see that there is really a tear uh, with some scar in sight too. So the tear never really healed, but there was scarring. And there, there's probably enough stabilization of the strength of the tendon around it where it stopped when I put pressure, pull, when I pulled it, uh, it stopped having uh, micro tears and therefore the symptoms got much better. Uh, uh, before arthroscopy and, and MRI, um, we used to do surgery quite infrequently on shoulders a large series were considered to be like 20 or 30 cases. Uh, now the large series are 400 cases. Yeah. Before we had the studies, uh, people waited it out and got well, just like John did here. Uh, that was very common. I used to see the shoulders were almost as common to, to see it in an orthopedic office, especially in sports medicine. Uh, uh, as backs, uh, so it's a, it's a very common problem, and I, I'm I'm sure I treated many many pe people with with um, uh, just an exercise and sometimes rest in a sling for a while um, on many many cases that I didn't operate on. I probably would say for every shoulder I saw, I probably operated one out of forty. Wow. Well, well, it's interesting now on subsequent years here, if I stop doing the physical therapy exercises, after a couple of months, I, I start getting pain back in the area of the shoulder. If I go back to do the exercises regularly, the pain actually goes away. So it's really kind of a, an interesting phenomenon. But uh, just to let you uh, point out, now I, I've also seen many other patients where I've had small uh -huh. tears like this, and when you see them, uh, a year or two later, the tears become massive, so it doesn't always get better. Yes, I do, I do the same thing. I do my own exercises, and it works out pretty good. Yeah, uh, adducting the shoulder without stressing the supraspinatus. Right. Yep. Okay. Let's see. Here's another case. Dashali, what do you think of this case? A 60-year-old radiologist with shoulder pain and weakness. We have a coronal and sagittal PD fat set images. And uh, within the anterior fibers of the supraspinatus tendon, you can see a full thickness defect. Um, and on the, on the coronal, you can see that as well, um, predominantly extending from the 
uh, maybe one centimeter from the insertion. Mm -hmm. And then there's also some sen some tendinosis. Yep. So uh, so th this was another radiologist, not me, who had kind of a similar uh, tear and uh, also refused surgery and did well with physical therapy. Uh, this is on three, let's see, this is 4-28-2003. I think this is the same patient. And here we can start seeing a lot of scar in situ in the area where there is the prior previous tear. Dr. Cruz? Yes. If if we were going to do an arthrogram on this patient, would that area enhance? Uh, but what typically happens at this stage is if you do arthrography, you typically will see fluid going into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa and this area of degenerative disease that we see uh, associated with the end of the tendon will tend to get brighter on the T1 fat sat images. Uh, we don't do pre and post anymore, but back in the days when we did, you would see that the tendon, the degenerative part of the tendon will take up the contrast and enhance to some extent. Uh, nowadays, we don't do pre-injection imaging, so you would just see some increased signal intensity uh, within the degenerative part of the tendon. Uh, later like this, uh, a lot of, this is all scar tissue in here as well, scar in situ, and that's variable as to how much it will actually pick up the contrast when you do an arthrogram study. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so let's go on and talk a little bit about tears of the rotator cuff. So, uh, first let's talk about partial tears. And uh, you can get acute muscle strains or tears. You can get tears at the muscular tendinous junction, uh, you can get transverse longitudinal, and you can get tears of the foot plate. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, tears have been graded into different sizes. Uh, Harvey Elman, who was at UCLA, uh, said grade th uh, one if they're less than three millimeters, two if they're between three and six millimeters, and grade three if they're greater than six millimeters. Uh, partial tears now are often uh, graded as low grade if they're less than 50% of the thickness tendon or high grade if they're greater than 50% of the thickness of the tendon. There are some people who believe that for symptomatic high grade partial tears, uh, patients uh, are best treated by surgery, uh, but that's pretty controversial. Uh, John, do you want to comment on any of these? Uh, yeah, surgery is, uh, is not indicated in uh, high in, in low-grade uh, thickness tears. Uh, High-grade is, uh, like you said, uh, somewhat controversial. But um, follow-up on a fairly large series on uh, low-grade uh, thickness tears uh, uh, doesn't prove that there is any problem with, with, with the shoulder uh, with time. Okay. Now, all partial thickness tears will progress but that doesn't mean the symptoms will progress. And the main reason you operate on shoulders is for pain. Of course, function is very important, but most people get surgery because of pain. Okay, thank you. So there are some uh, kind of special names that you might hear around. There's a pasta, which was popularized by Steve Schneider here in the Valley, which is partial articular surface tendon avulsions. And they're really avulsions at the foot plate. And uh, the two lesions I showed to you of the radiologist in their early stages would be little pasta tears because they're avulsions at the tendon insertion. And then there's a paint, partial thickness articular surface intratendinous uh, from Conway, a tendency in overhead athletes. Uh, the foot plate is intact, and these are, these are probably breakdown of the actual tendon itself due to overuse. Uh, and they tend to primarily be on the articular surface. As John said earlier at the, when we started today, 90% uh, uh, of uh, tears really start at the, art well, 90% of the surface tears tend to start on the articular surface, not the bursal side surface, though most tears at cadaver studies are, are really interstitial tears. Is that correct, John? Uh, yes, it is an older population. So, uh, let's see, uh, uh, Dan, what do you think of this? 
looks like we got a Chrono um, PD Fat Sad on the left and a T2 or PD on the right. Um, it looks like there is a um, muscle that's increased signal, so like a moderate grade tendinosis or straining. Uh, I believe that's uh, infraspinatus. So there's a, yeah, so basically um, the red, uh, okay, <laughs> it's tray, so okay. So you can get actual tears of the muscle. Uh, let's see, uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? Hello, yeah. So it looks like we have on the, you know, on the left we have a, uh, let's see, uh, PD, or it's actually T2, sorry, T2, uh, and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, axial, and then on the right we have a, let's see, a PD fat set, axial, and um, so it looks like we have a, a great deal of edema uh, involving the, uh, let's see, infraspinatus tendon, uh, it looks like uh, probably another, another partial tear, and on the, and this is also confirmed too on the uh, uh, so sagittal sequence for significant edema. This is a much larger tear than on the prior one. And uh, so this was an acute injury. Maybe it had a little subscap injury as well. So this is an acute mm -hmm. muscle tear. And these are treated conservatively. Can't really suit your muscle well. Okay, Dashali, what do you think of this case? We have an axial PD fat set in sagittal T2 and a coronal T2. Okay. Um, and there's striated increased uh, fluid signal within the infraspinatus muscle. Um, and then on the axial image... Yeah, uh, there's probably a little bit in the infraspinatus, but most of this is probably in this muscle. What muscle is that? Terry's minor. Yeah, so teres minor. So a little bit of interest. Then, you can actually tear the teres minor as well. Okay. Good. Okay. What do you think here? All right. We have a series of axial, looks like PD fat set of um, shoulder. Um, again, we have, I think it's infraspinatus, um, again, tear. Deltoid as well, but mostly the teres minor. Oh, teres minor. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? Uh, let's see, a 38-year-old male with shoulder pain and limitations of motion after a lifting injury. Uh, we have uh, <clears throat> two coronal images of the shoulder. It looks like a, a PD and a PD fat set. And uh, uh, I'd say that we have uh, Essentially, a fatty replacement of the teres minor okay. uh, muscle there. Right. So, and uh, yeah. so here you can see the teres minor atrophy, and this is probably post-traumatic. And uh, once you get this kind of fatty atrophy, it tends not to come back. You can see that this was actually a weightlifter, where the rest of the muscles are really quite hypertrophied, uh, but this that was injured and and really was uh, atrophic. So, Dishali, what do you think of this case? 17-year-old female with pain after fall. So there's sagittal um, PD, uh, maybe that can sagittal, sagittal T2 and uh, coronal PD fat set yep. with uh, a lot of edema within the expected location of the teres minor tendon. Yeah, good. Or teres minor muscle, so from a acute tear and you can see the retracted uh, tendon. Right, so that was an avulsive tear of the tendon at its insertion on the on the humerus. Okay. Got a 23-year-old baseball pitcher, uh, weakness for four months, no trauma except for baseball. Um, so we got a chrono, looks like a PD, and um, also axial, looks like a, a T1. T1 and, and Go both, both T1. So it looks like we have supraspinatus um, increased fatty infiltration um, throughout. So, yeah, so you're worried about uh, since only supraspinatus, uh, but the tendon actually, the distal tendon is intact. Um, 
So I'm not sure what would be the cause. I mean, would you be worried about like you know neurogenic degeneration? You know, of the subscapularis. All the other muscles. Are, yeah. So this is why it's most likely due to traumatic injury of the nerves innervating it. Yes, and we don't always see the uh, cyst. You know, you'd like to see a cyst in the suprascapular notch compressing the nerve, but there was no cyst in this case. But I think you can get traumatic injury to the nerve without necessarily having a cyst, which is compressing on it. So we, we see this uh, occasionally. Uh, it's amazing how isolated infraspinatus arterius minor atrophy can be compensated well. It's harder to compensate for supraspinatus and subscapularis atrophy, but the deltoid does a fairly good job with the supraspinatus. Okay, uh, and then here's just a case of, on a 14-year-old who had acute pain in the shoulder after I think he was uh, hit, he was a quarterback, I think, and this was in football practice. What we can see here is increased signal intensity on the T1-weighted image within the distal tendon, higher signal intensity on the PD fat set, and this was an acute strain of the supraspinatus tendon uh, without a tear. And on the T2-weighted image, you can see it's still intact, so it's not torn. Uh, but we have a muscle strain. Here's another uh, young individual. Uh, I think he was in his uh, around 20 years of age uh, who was also playing football, came down on his shoulder. What we can see here is an acute muscular tendinous tear at the muscular tendinous junction of the supraspinatus muscle and tendon. The tendon is intact. And again, in the younger people, the tendon is not what's the weak point. The weak point is really the muscle and the muscular tendinous junction. Uh, this was treated conservatively and he did well, but that's musculotendinous junction strain, uh, which you, you can see in young, young uh, athletes. Here's a 16-year-old male pitcher who had pain after throwing for two weeks, and again, here we can see musculotendinous injury of the distal muscle itself with edema and thickening. Uh, the tendon just has some minimal changes in it, and again, this is treated conservatively and he did fine. So uh, don't forget that you can actually have muscle injuries, <clears throat> especially in the young athletes. Okay, let's see, who's next? I forgot who did the last, who did the last one. Dan, what do you think? Sorry. I had a 31-year-old uh, male with pain after a weightlifting injury. Uh, again, we have a chrono, it uh, looks like a P. T2, I'm guessing, T2, T2 and a PD fat set. So there is a increased signal again on the supraspinatus muscle cutaneous or muscle, like more, uh, so it's just a low grade sprain. But the distal tendon looks maybe like very mild tendinosis, no no obvious tear. At the muscle cutaneous junction, there's maybe like articular, I mean, I'm sorry, bursal surface, partial thickness. On the chrono, it uh, looks like there is increased signal within the supraspinatus, like superior muscle belly, suggestive of you know fat infiltration or actually sprain. On this case, yeah. So, but we see tendon disease all the time. I just want to kind of remind you, in the young athletes, muscle tears are actually quite common in the shoulder, and they're treated completely differently. And here we can actually see a partial tear at the muscular tendonous junction, with a little avulsion injury at the distal tendon itself. Okay, uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? All right, so the T2 fat set, uh, possibly after uh, inje uh, intraarticular drug and contrast. Yep. Uh, so uh, it looks like at the, uh, the distal supraspinatus, <laughs> there's some articular sided fraying. Yep. Uh, so you can see the yeah. irregular. This should be a nice, smooth line. When it's irregular like that, that's actually uncommon. I mean, not, not uncommon, that's abnormal. We can actually see a little contrast actually going into the muscular tendinous junction here. A little avulsion injury of the bone here at the, ins at the insertion. On the T2-weighted image, we could actually po see pooling of fluid uh, in that defect within the inferior surface of the tendon. Uh, so this was an inferior surface uh, partial tear and a lot of fraying, as you said. Okay. Uh, Deshali, what do you think of this case? <clears throat> We have an arthrogram exam with uh, coronal PD fat set and sagittal T2 and uh, an axial PD fat set. Okay. Um, and so there's a contrast that's going into the undersurface of the supraspinatus tendon in the mid substance. And then on the axials, 
um, we can say that propagating proximally. Um, so this is a partial thickness, moderate articular sided tear that looks like, um, given the contrast going in on the. What's what's this little thing right here? I, I can't see your mouse, Doctor Cruz. Oh, you can't. Uh, John and Jeff, can you see the mouse? Yes. Yeah. I don't know why you can't see it, Deshali. That's odd. We. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, off to the lateral side, uh, we can see a little bit. It almost looks like a zipper artifact on the image on the right, the axial image, and that was actually an arthroscopy tract, and uh, this was a. Uh, uh, there we can see other images showing the tract or the arthroscope that goes right into where the actual tear is. And this was uh, uh, a little defect due to the arthroscopic portal and uh, was not an actual tear. So to remember, after surgery, sometimes you can see uh, these arthroscopic portal tracks. Okay. And here we can see a coronal PD fat sat image. Uh, and uh, what we see here is focal increased signal intensity within the supraspinatus tendon. It may be a little bit thickened there, but it looks like the bursal side surface and the joint side surfaces are intact uh, in the area of the high signal intensity. Uh, if we blow that up, we can see it a little better here. The inferior surface looks intact. The superior surface looks intact. Uh, but we can see that there is signal in between the two. Uh, and this is really tendinosis. And in our experience, uh, the, these look normal at arthroscopy because the surface is intact. But we can see there's significant disease uh, in the uh, interstices of the uh, tendon itself. So uh, I would just comment on these. When you see intact surfaces, it's probably, our experience is, it's going to be a negative uh, arthroscopy. <clears throat> and, and that's important because you describe these, and we have cases, and I've seen a number of cases where surgeons have brought them to me from the outside uh, where uh, there's been a tear called by the radiologist and the arthroscopist has gone in and he's seen a normal uh, cuff. Uh, so there's been the question as to why is that the case? And as long as you see those surfaces intact, my experience is that the uh, arthroscopist is going to see a normal appearing uh, rotator cuff. Uh, let's see. Dan? Yeah. If I recall, John, there was a learning curve. But... What was that, John? As I recall, there was a learning curve in terms of intra uh, tendinous yes. tear. Yeah, yeah. It took us a while to learn these things. Yeah. And I think John suffered through some of that learning. So we got a chrono and sagittal T2 arthrogram of the shoulder. Again, we see increased signal at the distal supraspinatus tendon. It looks like the both articular and bursal surface and the sagittal, and the chrono view looks like it's intact, but uh, on the sagittal, it looks like, so is it intersubstant either it's tendinosis or maybe like partial thickness intersubstant um, tear. On this chrono T2, I'm sorry, PD fat sat, um, the signal is it's pretty bright, and it looks like it's maybe communicating uh, inferior to the articular surface. So there's like a high-grade partial thickness tear. And this turned out to be a partial thickness tear. So uh, uh, the, I, I found that the best way to look for the surfaces is that to do the PD fat sat image and window it to see whether you can see the intact inferior surface by window changing the window and level. And if you can't, uh, even if you change the window level so that the fluid's not so bright, uh, then that's indicative of a partial tear and not uh, tendinosis. Uh, uh, John? Yes. Uh, everybody, sometimes when, when surgery is done, uh, the surgeon doesn't probe enough. Um, they see that everything looks smooth, and then, then they think that uh, all is well. If they put a probe in this, they could probably find uh, a degenerative tear. Okay, good. I mean, not complete tear, but yeah, partial. partial. Yeah, be able to find the interstitial component. Okay, uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? 
Yeah, hi. Uh, okay. So 27-year-old major league baseball pitcher with increasing posterior axillary pain after pitching, relativities minor or latissimus tear, and we have a, it's like a PD fat sat. Uh, like I say, uh, what I'm seeing is that the, uh, I mean, at the foot, uh, footprint, I mean, there's some, uh, uh, so, uh, some cortical cyst formation at the footprint there. I mean, at the most, I would say there's I mean, some tendinosis of the uh, uh, supraspinatus tendon uh, without a tear. And the inferior uh, surface certainly looks intact going through here. But what this mm -hmm. is, this is a bone avulsion injury uh, involving oh. the the uh, portion of the of the uh, supraspinatus tendons, which are on the joint side surface. So this is on 429.09. Uh, uh, at this time, he was arthroscoped, and the tendon was intact, and this really couldn't be seen very well. Uh, but then he came back with increased pain only a month later after pitching. What do you see here? I mean, here now it looks more apparent. Uh, well, all right. So there's significant. Okay. So there's significantly increased uh, signal along the articular portion of the distal supraspinatus, uh, and uh, there's also more marrow edema at the uh, footprint as well. Um, so it appears to me that there's been progression. I mean, as you yeah. described, it was an avulsion, uh, and I would say that there's been progression of this avulsion uh, injury. Uh, distal right. So, so what we yeah. now see is a, a bigger defect in the bone. Uh, the, a little bit of bone has actually been pulled off here, more edema within the bone, and now we see a significant partial tear of the inferior surface of the tendon, uh, which was grossly abnormal at arthroscopy. So what you can see is once you start developing a mechanical breakdown, uh, which in young kids tends to occur at the bone the interface, uh, once this breaks down, you can get rapid progression of tearing of the associated soft tissues, which we see on the right. So this is just a matter of five weeks but between these two. But after this study, he continued to pitch, and, uh, and this is what's happened. And, and, and as you can see here, the strains are predominantly in these young athletes on the joint side surface, and that's why John said that the more recent or orthopedic literature shows that 90% of the tears uh, which are on the surface occur on this inferior surface on these athletes, as opposed to what we thought years before uh, in, in older individuals, where a lot of the tears can occur from impingement on the bursal side surface. But in the young athletes, it's really this joint side surface, uh, which is where uh, the, the tears really start. And uh, got that uh, left image, um, uh, if the arthroscope what you, what you have to do is put put more weight on on an arm and get more visualization um, and abduct the arm more to get to that area. That's not an easy area to see. And I think, if I may say so, I I think with a little extra effort that should have been uh, seen. Um, I, I don't think that that I think that was torn from the get go. Yeah. Well, here it's still. I don't know what Paul was by the uh, radiologist, but I would say that's a, uh, from my ex minimum knowledge about uh, MRI, I think that's a tear. I would have done well should. Yeah, well, I certainly think there's a bone injury here. The tendon itself, at least the inferior surface, looks intact here. It looks like most of the pathology is actually at here at the tendon at the interface. Foot plate. Yeah, at the foot plate, right. Dr. Cruz? Yes. For this case, was there any change within the uh, superior labrum posteriorly? Uh, these are slightly different cuts. Uh, Bearing on, uh, I don't, I don't I mean, remember. On, the, on the rest of the case that we don't see. Yeah, I, I don't remember the labrum on this. I don't remember it as having changed, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. I would be... A, Surprised that we did have a marked change in the labrum in that time frame. Uh, Dashali, what do you think of this case? Okay, so you have a coronal T coronal T1 image, and um, the supraspinatus tendon um, demonstrates some increased or intermediate T1 signal intensity, and then in the mid aspect, 
uh, at approximately the 12 o'clock position, there's some almost like fat signal intensity within the tendon, the myotendinous junction. And you can certainly see that at the musculotendinous junction, at the musculotendinous junction. The inferior surface looks intact, but again, we can see some uh, traction bone injury here uh, of the subcortical uh, trabecular bone near the foot plate. And then uh, uh, here's a I think this is a T2 on the right and a PD fat set on the left, where again we can see this bone injury and the marked increased signal intensity within the substance of the of the tendon itself. Maybe a little bit of partial tear at the at the foot plate insertion. Uh, but I just want to point out that we commonly see uh, bony changes at the insertion of the supraspinatus. And for anyone over the age of about 30, we almost always see change at the insertion of the infraspinatus, especially the overlap area where the infraspinatus and supraspinatus fibers come together and jointly attach to the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity. And these bony changes are due to traction injuries of the underlying, uh, underlying bone. Uh, <clears throat> they tend to be more symptomatic when they're in the supraspinatus portion they tend not to be so symptomatic when they're more posteriorly in the region of the infraspinatus insertion. And then again, we can see primarily interstitial disease within the tendon itself. Uh, yeah. 61-year-old dance instructor with increasing shoulder pain one year after a fall. <clears throat> we have axial, looks like a T1 or PD and a PD fat sat to the right. And we have traction changes at the posterior lateral aspect of the humeral head near the infraspinatus insertion of fibers. So this is um, so this is on 6, 8, 18. 14. That's on the same date that was the sagittal images. Mm -hmm. So we see again traction changes with maybe mild tendinosis of the, the edema. Okay, this and is 4, 11, it looks like so that. This is 6, 8, 14. This is now 10 months later. So in 10 months, it looks like uh, this traction change has progressed, and now it's uh, it, it may cause some impingement, but the patients like you know internally or externally rotate and getting that traction or defect get caught on the uh, glenoid, and then there's subscap tendinosis, yeah. See much more edema in the bone. bone, yeah. So, so, uh, uh, so this the primary. In, in, Injury probably was the fall with uh, acute traction of the infraspinatus uh, attachment. Uh, and uh, with ongoing use of the shoulder, we can see that there's persistent irritation on the bone with traction injury here and increasing granulation tissue in the area where the bone's trying to heal but can't completely heal because of ongoing traction injury. So these, these are really common. When they're this size and when they have bone edema, they're probably highly likely to be symptomatic. Okay. Uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? All right. So uh, see, we have a 17-year-old male with new onset of shoulder pain, uh, real out label tear or bicep flexation, and we have uh, chronal PD fat set and T2 images. Uh, so demonst looks like on the so on the uh, PD fat side, uh, we certainly we have a uh, high signal uh, within the uh, distal uh, uh, supraspinatus tendon, and um, it looks like on the T2 that area is sort of intermediate in signal. Uh, so I'm looking at this thinking that we have maybe some, uh, some either some I think we have some maybe some granulation tissue in there. Uh, Okay, so what we have here is a partial tear where the inferior okay. fibers of the supraspinatus have a complete tear with retraction, but the superior okay. fibers are still intact. And okay. th this is not a, this is fairly common tear type, especially in younger individuals, especially athletes. Again, it kind of goes to the point where these inferior fibers tend to be under much more strain in athletic uh, activity than the more superficial fibers which we can see continue to be intact here. So, so this is a, uh, a partial tear, but with retraction of the, of the inferior fibers. 
and uh, this is uh, what some people will call a pasta type tear. Okay. Uh, John, do you want to comment on, on these kind of tears and the treatment? Well, this one uh, would need um, arthroscopic repair. Okay. Um, right. But it's a, it's a, a, a two-plane uh, tear. It's a transverse tear off the foot plate and then along the duodenal tear uh, towards the muscle. Yep. So it, it, it may need uh, more than arthroscopy. Whenever we uh, get a, a permit signed for surgery, we always put down arthroscopic procedure and whatever you're going to do arthroscopically and then possible uh, arthrotomy and repair. Yeah. So that, that you, you, you always leave yourself an out if you cannot do it arthroscopically. Okay. All right, so here's a T1-weighted sequence where we see a lot of increased signal intensity within the supraspinatus tendon. PD fat set where we see high signal intensity, especially on the inferior surface with loss of the normal surface. Looks like a very, if not full thickness tear, certainly a very high grade partial tear. And here's the T2-weighted sequence where we can see increased signal intensity on the inferior surface. And uh, this one is certainly greater than 50% of thickness. And at, at uh, arthroscopy, this was a high-grade partial tear, but the superior fibers were still intact. So that's a, a high-grade partial tear. Here we can see on a T2-weighted image, we can see a lot of fluid in the interstices, inter, interstices of the uh, supraspinatus tendon. On the PD fat set, really it looks like there's a tear going to the inferior surface uh, on, the, on the arthrogram with orthographic contrast. Uh, going into the tendon, but it does not go all the way through. Uh, here are the axial images showing what looks like a full thickness defect there. And uh, at surgery, this was a, a high-grade partial tear, uh, primarily involving the joint side surfaces of the tendon. And that was in a Major League Baseball pitcher. Here we can see other disease, increased signal intensity on the T1, high signal intensity on the T2. Uh, but again, we're not not quite sure that it goes all the way through the the joint side surface, so this would be a, a high-grade interstitial tear at the foot plate insertion. Uh, here we can see a high, uh, high signal intensity within the tendon itself. This patient was arthroscoped, and this tear was not seen at arthroscopy. Uh, and they did both a joint side arthroscope, and they also put the scope in the, uh, in the bursal side. Uh, so this was an interstitial tear of the tendon, and it was most likely symptomatic because the patient had typical symptoms for a rotator cuff. They elected not to repair this uh, at this point. Uh, here's another type of interstitial tear. Here we see a longitudinal tear going through the fibers. These almost always will communicate with the joint side surface distally, and then the, the fluid will, through increased pressure, will extend proximally into the muscular tendinous junction and into the muscle proper. So this is really a longitudinal tear. So this is the other kind of partial tear uh, that you can see uh, in the tendon. And here are the uh, sagittal images showing the, the tear with the fluid. And you can see, if you can follow these back, and usually you can see them going to the joint side surface. Sometimes the actual communication to the joint space may be difficult to see on the IBAR examination. Uh, here's a CT arthrogram. Uh, where you can see the CT contrast going into the tear and the interstices of the uh, supraspinatus. And here are other images, the axial images and the sagittal images showing the fluid within the tear itself. Other examples, this is on a low field scan where we can see these uh, uh, longitudinal uh, tears uh, within the tendon. Sometimes the cyst here can be quite large within both the supra or infraspinatus. This happens to be an infraspinatus longitudinal interstitial tear, uh, which did communicate with the joint space here uh, distally uh, near uh, its insertion of the tendon. And this is what it looks like on the oblique sagittal images. Uh, uh, interstitial tears in this location are not uncommon in the infraspinatus muscle and tendon. John? Yes, John. Um, in orthopedic literature, what I've read is uh, they, they talk about intratendinous tears rather than interstitial. Okay. Uh, in, interstitial uh, 
pertains mainly to cellular structures, doesn't it? Uh, I don't know. I, I think so, and, and, and that's why they say intra, intratendinous. So, so this would be intratendinous here, but it would be intramuscular back here. That's correct. So it's kind of longitudinal. I think intratendinous is fine. That's a, that's a good word. Intratendinous and intramuscular tears. Yes, sir. Good. I like that. Thanks, John. You bet. Let's see. Who is next? Dashali, are you next? Mm-hmm. Okay, what do you think of this one? The coronal and sagittal PD fat set images, and uh, so the arrow is pointing to uh, area of high signal intensity uh, along the inter aspect of the myotin and description of the CSU. Okay, control. and this is an arthrogram. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that, so this is on 4-14-2003, uh, where it's either a tear or since these are both PD fat sets, this could actually also be uh, a muscular tendinous junction tear, or it could be a tendon, intratendinous and intramuscular uh, tear, which communicates with the joint space. Uh, so this is now, uh, this was on 4-14-2003. The patient came back four years later, and this is what it looks like. Okay, so now we have a lobulated area of fluid. Um, within the myotendinous junction. Um, so this is like way past the arthrogram, so it's likely a propagation of fluid from a tear or distally. Yeah, um, so, so this is not an arthrogram here. This is just a heart-shaped uh, intramuscular tear and a linear intratendinous tear, which we can see here kind of nicely. So th this was really a intratendinous tear that's uh, early stage we saw before was an early intramuscular component of it, and over time that just enlarged and be became larger. Okay. So you call it an intramuscular cyst too with a tear? Or is it... I just, I call it intramuscular tears, okay. but uh, because, uh, you know, uh, you just need to describe it and make sure that the, the surgeon knows that you're dealing with a tear that most likely is longitudinal along inside the tendon, which communicates with the joint space, and then it's causing a collection of fluid, which with increased pressure dissects into the muscle. I think that's what's occurring here. And obviously they can be symptomatic for that. Okay. Uh, okay. Dan, what do you think of this case? So we got uh, Chronos, uh, looks like T... I'm sorry, T1 or PD on the top and PD fat set on the top bottom, T2 fat set and T2 or T2. So it looks like we have uh, a fluid collection within the supraspinatus muscle belly, um, kind of like it's low on the PD fat set and also on T2 and I guess on T1 is just kind of like... So... Um, it's decreased signal, so it's not it's not fat because it's not like bright on T1, and it's not fluid because it's not bright on T2. So it could be like <laughs> I guess like calcification, like something like you know, um, yeah, or like um, air. Hematoma, <laughs> acute hematoma, okay. So, so this is an acute hematoma, uh, typically within days or a week of the, of the hemorrhage, where you still have uh, uh, intracellular hemoglobin, where the hemoglobin molecule, where the cell, the, the red cell membranes haven't burst yet. And so this is actually intracellular hemoglobin, which causes dephasing and low signal intensity on all pulse sequences. So this is actually what a kind of acute or hyperacute hematoma would look like within the muscle. So this is an acute injury where you have fluid and hemorrhage into it. And here we can see all this low signal intensity. Um, within hours or day. Yeah, pretty acute. Okay. And here we can see another case where we have high signal intensity going in the infraspinatus. And this is uh, another case of a longitudinal tear, intratendinous intramuscular tear going into the uh, infraspinatus. Uh, let me just see where we are here. 
So why don't we do this one case and we'll stop after this case. So Jeff, why don't you take the last case here? All right, 37 year old male with pain with real love of return yeah. tear. I can't hear you, Jeff. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry again. 37 year old male of pain, rule out rotator cuff tear. And we have a, a PD fat side image. Uh, it looks like a high signal of the distal supraspinatus on the articular side. Uh, it looks like it's extending into the intersubstance. Is this injury in the supraspinatus or infraspinatus tendon? Um, well, it could it could be the uh, far. Uh, it could be the far posterior uh, supraspinatus versus the conjoint portion uh, of the tendon. Uh, but uh, it looks like there's, looking at these images here, as to say, it's an intersubstance uh, uh, tear of the tendon extending into the muscle. And yeah. okay. it looks like so kind of fast for me. <laughs> So, so this uh, looks like the supraspinatus, maybe a little bit of impingement here. Supraspinatus <laughs> muscle going on, and here we can see the tear of the, of the tendon, a little bit of bony avulsion injury there. And if we do the, the coronal images going posteriorly, we can actually see that the fluid looks more prominent here going more posteriorly. And if we continue going posteriorly, we can see that intratendinous tear that John was talking about before. If we continue to follow it, we actually see that the fluid continues and extends into the infraspinatus. So uh, what I'm really kind of pointing out, and then here we can see, whoops, sorry about that. And here we can see that the, the fluid is in the uh, infraspinatus muscle. And if we uh, go back up, well, here, what we, we can actually see, uh, what if we look on the sagittal images in, this is supraspinatus. This area in here is really a combined fibers intermixed between the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Here's the infraspinatus and here's the teres minor. So often the, uh, a lot of the fibers of the infraspinatus can actually attach much more anteriorly than we often think. And therefore this was actually a tear primarily the infraspinatus tendons. And you can see the fluid extending posteriorly into the infraspinatus. The supraspinatus insertion uh, was actually fine. And the infraspinatus overlap area is back here uh, where the tendon, where the tear occurred. So why don't we actually stop here? And I'll be gone all next week. Uh, you know, let's see, any questions?